Alexandrians, what up? My name is Noah. Welcome to Table Ready. This is the critical review, and right now we're going to talk about the bad from episodes 36 and 37. Now, my ratings and reviews shouldn't be taken with that much weight. Uh, they're just musings and thoughts, but if you don't agree, tell me in the comments. So as I said, this is the bad and the ugly of episode 36 and 37. So if you're not interested in hearing me get kind of critical of the critical role casting crew, then I would suggest you go and watch the other video for this week instead. It's much more positive and really just has good vibes and doesn't have all the critical things that I'm getting ready to say. Either way, thank you for clicking on the video and uh, yeah, let's get into it. So I personally uh, am not above some fan service. I'm, I'm a fan of it uh, at times. Times, but when it gets overdone, I am pretty much out. With like all the live action Disney movies being remade, I it's just not a thing for me. Like nostalgia only gets me so far. The thing has to be good. For instance, I would give like the new Disney suite of movies like fours out of 10, mainly because I don't find them to uh, redo the stories in ways that I think are meaningful. And they cut out all the dope villain music that I loved so much from the originals. So moving forward, uh, a lot of just like reintroducing the characters, it doesn't have that huge impact on me. Which is why I was hoping that there'd be some cool twist rather than just having Matt play all of the characters. And honestly, his ability to do so, I don't think was top notch. When I'm critical and I say, I don't think Matt did a great job playing all of the characters, that is not to say that I would do even remotely close. Not even, not even the least bit. I can't keep three accents in my mind at the same time, let alone as many as Matt does. That being said, it didn't hit home for me the way that I expected. Now one high rating thing that I would give to Matt here and the entire table is a an 8 out of 10 for trust. Like, it is hard to take on characters that someone else has built and invested in. My DM runs a game in the same world that we play in. And sometimes he takes on my character of Grawl Stonefist uh, to give quests or things of that nature. And even that like is a trusting scenario. Like, oh man, is he gonna play Grawl the way that I played Grawl? Is he going to take liberties with my character that uh, I wouldn't agree with? It just takes a lot of trust, you know? And that's, that's big, that shouldn't be discounted. Out of them though, I do think he placed his uh, importance and his focus on role playing Percy the, the best, which is important because of how that he was kind of a, uh, a barrier for the party. I think he did a decent job with Vex, but I didn't get the same vibes. The accent was a little odd and uh, I think he did okay with Pike. I don't know. There was some of that like slapstick, uh, goofy home game cursing inappropriate jokes nature of the party that was kind of lost. So overall, I'd give it like a, a five out of 10. One thing that I really wanted to talk about is, and I feel like I've been picking on Taliesin a lot, and I don't mean to, um, just lately I think he's been breaking out of uh, the mold. And so it is a little bit odd to see that now, but the weirdness of him going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Percy in that conversation, I low-key expected Percy to just turn around, pop, pop, destroy both of Ashton's kneecaps, tell Pike to clean him up off of the floor and send him on his way. But hey, people grow over time and uh, that's fine. But the weird thing was the struggle Olympics that Taliesin got Ashton into with Percy. Like, Percy had a completely objectively like reasonable position to be in. Like, why would I give you something that you're asking me for, risk everything I've sacrificed so long for to bring back potentially somebody who killed everyone I love just because you think you have it bad. As much as Ashton does suffer, Percy suffered too, and Percy is not one to lose that game. It just felt weird, and I get not wanting to operate your character in, like, with meta, but that didn't stop Orem, which, let's talk about that. Orem brought up information about Percy being possessed that I'm sure was limited to only a couple of people. I highly doubt that Percy or Party was going around talking about how the the King of Whitestone 
was very recently possessed by a demon. Yeah, so I don't really know which way to go on that. I think for, for Orem, that moment of like pulling out that extra metagame information, that gets a three out of 10 for me. Was it a, a good move? Absolutely, but was it in the meta and something I don't think he should have known? Absolutely. I will actually give Talison a higher rating, around a, a five or a six, because I do think that that was an important moment and that that's what Ashton would do and Ashton wouldn't give a shit about uh, how hard Percy's life was. But it just went on a little bit long and I couldn't tell if Talison thought that Ashton had a point or not. I'm hoping not. One thing that I think the party wasn't quite understanding and Percy tried to impart onto them is your friend doesn't mean shit if it means bringing Delilah back. And they were not taking Percy serious enough to say, hey, we're on your side too. Delilah killed Laudna and all these other, your entire family. But instead they just kind of made it sound like, hey, we have a point too and we love someone so you should bring them back. Taking Percy with a little bit more seriousness and then asking for help in destroying the last remnants of Delilah um, might have gotten them further. I do really like that Vex still went to support them and had that like caring um, feelings of guilt to, to help drive the story forward and that Pike was able to assist with getting them to this astral plane. Something I wanted to mention though is FCG. That whole encounter with FCG finding out that he had a soul bothered me. You see, Sam is the kind of player that I don't doubt might have wanted to just be soulless. He may have been trying to say something like, hey, just because I'm not alive like all of you and I don't have a soul like all of you doesn't mean that I shouldn't be valued. Also, it sets Sam's character up to potentially be a martyr and kind of like part of the programming is, I'm expendable, you're not, let me serve you and self-sacrifice for all of you that I see as being more important. But the party doesn't act that way. They almost treat him like he has to have a soul in order to be valuable. No, no, FCG, you definitely have a soul. You're just like us. But what does this say about if they were wrong? What if Pike went through and found out, hey, there's nothing there. They've all kind of put themselves in a corner where FCG is now no longer considered as valuable or they have to walk back their previous statements. Like, what does this mean about Doty, for instance? All this to say that I hope Sam was kind of approached before this. If not, this gets like a 2 out of 10 for me because that is such an integral part of his character. What you're trying to say with your character, if you're trying to say something with your character, is so core to their existence. I mean, when Sam found out, he said, oh man, started to have fear for the first time and like, I have to live and what does that mean? And all of these things that fundamentally change FCG as a character. So if that's not what Sam wanted, I really wouldn't doubt that FCG ends up exiting the campaign at some point and then Sam comes in with a new character, which is something that he typically does mid-campaign anyways. Which is good because uh, the arc of FCG struggling with self-preservation now really doesn't interest me that much, but you know what? To each their own, I'm gonna love watching either way. And all the dramatizations of going through the spirit world were really cool and I liked them. And I just wonder what the consequence is going to be of all of these actions when the party leaves. I also wish it were a little more explicit how like their 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 cords were being used. Like was it if their max hit points went down past zero? Does that mean they're straight dead? When Delilah killed them, did that mean that like, I, I just was a little confused about what was going on with the life thread. It didn't have that impact or that feeling of importance here either. The last thing that I wanna bring up is that I think Matt did a great job with making this type of death uh, seem more important and have more weight to it. And uh, I think it's, it's great. I think more DMs should do things that make death matter, but I don't think it solves the entire problem. So I am actually coming out with a video here soon about how we can make death matter in our campaigns and how I've done that in mine. So stay tuned for those things. If you wanna check out that video and some more tips and more CR stuff, then hit subscribe, make a mage hand out of the like button, and let me know in the comments below what I might've missed in the bad or the ugly. Yeah, this is gonna be the dark section of the comments. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. I'll check you later. Peace.